Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and today I'm very pleased to be speaking with Yatsu. He's the co-founder and chairman at Adamoga Brands. They're a game development studio and venture fund. They have helped incubate and have invested in some of the largest Web3 games and NFT brands. Uh, Yat is recognized as a really forward thinker when it comes to the impact of Web3 on digital ownership, on culture, uh, and uh, on, on sort of the broader impact of Web3 on the economy. And so I'm very happy to have him today and chat about a whole bunch of things, including, of course, NFTs, the metaverse, blockchain gaming, um, and uh, and a whole bunch of other spicy stuff. So yeah, thanks for joining us today. It's a great pleasure. Uh, wonderful to be here and look forward to having a spicy conversation, I guess. <laughs> well, well I, I try to make it spicy once in a while, but um, but also uh, hopefully I think like, you know, I, I was we were talking about this earlier on, on Epicenter. We 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 tend to cover a lot of infrastructure stuff. I mean, all of us hosts here at Epicenter are like have been in crypto for like, you know, eight or nine or 10 years. And and um, and of course, you know, when you've been in the space so long and you've came up with Bitcoin and Ethereum, you sort of tend to 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 gravitate towards infrastructure. At least that's been the case for us. And so gaming and NFTs is something that we haven't covered a ton on the show. Like, obviously, we've talked about them. We've had some folks on, but it's it's definitely one of the, you know, the topics that maybe comes up every couple of months. Like, you know, we had Immutable on recently, but I can't remember before that, like, when we last talked about NFTs, so probably during the last cycle. Um, but, um, you know, before we get started, like what sparked your interest in um, in NFTs? And, you know, at, at which point did Animoca decide, like, we're going all in in this, uh, this interesting new technology and industry? Well, I mean, I think we got into the space really actively through, you know, CryptoKitties uh, in 2017. Our studio, Fuel Powered, was actually involved in helping build a part of CryptoKitties. Uh, and actually, uh, the, the co-founder of uh, Fuel Powered um, ended up becoming the co one of the co-founders of Daffer Labs. And that's sort of how that evolved. And we ended up becoming shareholders and, of course, publishers of CryptoKitties, uh, you know, literally a month and a half after their launch uh, in Asia. So that's kind of how, how, how quickly we sort of went in the space. But I think the main lens as to why we're so fascinated with NFTs or its potential anyway at the time was that it was really about the cultural power in these economies that are being built around, right? So when we think of sort of the classic way that you might think of an L1, L2, for instance, you know, we do have this lens that we think of them as like national economies of sorts. Like you can measure them as a business. You measure them essentially as a sort of, you know, this community values, community network. Essentially, it's almost like, like a nation state. Um, and one of the things that you create more depth in any nation state, if you think about the physical world, is culture, right? In fact, you know, we describe culture as the deepest TVL of any healthy economy, right? When you think about what we purchase in the real world, whether it's fashion and clothes, even the real estate, you know, cars, you know, most of what we're buying is actually not its utility. I mean, we don't buy a car just to take it from point A to point B. If we did, then we'd go for the cheapest possible car there is. But no, we buy Ferraris, we buy Lamborghinis, we buy Rolls Royces, we buy Teslas because they have statements. And the same goes for fashion items, whether it's Birkin bags or sort of expensive shoes or, you know, watches. I mean, who buys a Rolex to tell the time, really, right? So, so these are sort of the cultural investments we have in that space. And one of the biggest areas of culture investment in the digital time that we spend time on is gaming, right? Gaming is a space that has over 3.2 billion people that play, which is basically almost two thirds of the world's internet. Um, it is probably the cultural thing that we do online that has its own sort of, you know, new kind of um, uh, sort of meme framework and culture framework that is gaming native as in digitally native. Uh, it's also the larger as an industry in comparison to music and film um, with over $200 billion um, sort of, uh, of, of revenue in the, gaming, in the gaming industry last year and this year will probably be larger. This does not include anything related to Web3, for instance. So... So these are sort of factors as to why we felt that it made sense because gamers themselves also already have a sense of digital ownership, even though they don't own anything, right? You ask a gamer who plays Fortnite and he has skins in Fortnite, he's not going to say, yeah, I rented those skins. It's, 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 it's great. It's like going to the tux for my prom night. No, They're, they, they think they own it, right? And when they own currency inside a game, virtual currency in this case, 
they think of it as currency they own, which is not that far away from cryptocurrency, at least in terms of the concepts. So we focused on gaming, not just because of our own background as a gaming studio, but also because we felt gamers had a more natural path of adoption, uh, which I think is, you know, uh, playing out when you think about sort of what happened with Axie Infinity, you know, in 21 uh, or Sandbox, for instance. And now basically, you know, when you think about on-chain activity, actually gaming is one of the biggest on-chain activities throughout, you know, any chain for that matter. Uh, so I think we're seeing those patterns evolve uh, in Web3. Yeah, I think uh, economists, you were talking about Rolexes and Ferraris and all, you know, economists, I think, call these positional goods, you know, yes. where I, I, I think that's the technical term for it. And uh, there's a whole there's a whole sketch by a, a, a sort of some somewhat emerging French comedian where he goes to Switzerland and, you know, he goes and buys a Rolex to see about whether or not he feels better. And uh, our, our, our French listeners will, will know what, what I'm talking about. It's quite funny. But yeah, but basically he sort of like talks about these positional goods. And, and I think NFTs, I always, when I saw this, I thought like, this is just like NFTs. I mean, a NFTs are about, you know, um, about an outward statement, right? I mean, you own an NFT, you put it on your like PFP or whatever, or like you own a skin in a game. And it's more of an outward statement about things that you identify with or ideas that you might identify with or a community that you might identify with. And I think that, that's an incredibly powerful. And, you know, we're, we're, we're talking before the show about how like a lot of people in web three, you know, don't, um, don't get it right. Like there, there is, I think like a, a divide in, in the blockchain industry where you have like a lot of people that are focused on crypto infrastructure, DeFi, these sort of like financial primitives. And then there's an entire other sector or part of the industry that's you know, really, you know, behind this sort of like web three branding, gaming, NFTs, and and gradients in between, mind you. But I, I think that the, the folks on the infrastructure side maybe don't understand this so well because their monoliths and avatars are the DeFi protocols themselves, right? They're sort of associated, I think, like very much to sort of like the culture behind and the memes behind the coins themselves rather than like the NFTs. Is that something that that you've observed as well? Or like how do you how do you you know account for this divide? Well, so first of all, I don't think there's a huge difference. It's just a matter of how you understand the narrative in your own construct, because again, it comes down to culture. And so really, when we think about NFTs, we think about NFTs as a way in which you can encapsulate culture in a deeper sense because of the fact that it is now unique in its nature. So the example I often give is wedding rings. You know, a wedding ring in itself could be argued to be quite fungible. <laughs> Certainly when you go to a Tiffany store, every wedding ring is made the same way, weighs exactly the same, and has the same value. But the moment that ring goes into the ownership of you, know, you and your partner, it becomes non-fungible in nature. It becomes something special. And it shares in the culture of only the two of you and maybe a small community that's around it. And that's really when we say non-fungible is what we mean. We don't necessarily mean that it has to be unique in the sense that it has to have a different coloration. You know, that's obviously the more outward expression, like what we see with the random PFP generations of something like Bored Apes. But it isn't actually the true meaning, at least from a human perspective, of non-fungible. You know, I think about the things that we collect in the physical world. Uh, we don't want to give up. Maybe a tennis racket that we used to win an important tournament. Or if we climb Mount Everest, then we will stick to those clothes that we can. We don't throw them out because they are entirely unique to our history, our legacy. Why do we care about things like ancestry? Why do we want to look at our history? Why are we inspired when we see a flag, right, of some nation or some stories? I mean, these actually form our culture. It's who we are. But the construction of the story itself is the shared culture, meaning that fungible tokens, when you think about things like, you know, and I don't mean just meme coins. I mean, just even things like, you know, Ethereum or Bitcoin in and of itself, ownership of that is already a kind of culture, but it's not really as individual. It's more of a collective culture that is shared um, across the communities there. And maybe what the, the challenging thing that I think most people struggle with isn't the culture side. It's the fact that they don't think culture has value often, right? They think culture is hard to value versus, you know, versus, um, you know, something that is maybe like, like, like currencies or gold or infrastructure. There is a utility behind it. And it's true, the utility is important. But when you think about us as people, and this is the part where I would say, if you're, you know, maybe very technically focused, and you don't care about what you wear, for instance. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, that a maybe, lot of people in crypto don't. You know, they just, <laughs> I guess they just wear the t-shirts. Well, it depends. I mean, you know, it's funny. I talk to some, <laughs> I talk to people, and then they have this really fancy watch, or they have this really expensive car, right? And you're yeah. like, 
why did you buy that car? Oh, because it drives really fast. Uh, sure. Like, you know, try that. And, you know, why do people drive, you know, buy really fast cars in Hong Kong, which have really narrow streets and you can't really drive fast, right? Um, so you're making a statement about who you are. And it's, a, it's again, membership of a culture uh, and of your own culture, for instance. And I think as people, this is really defining us, these stories, these narratives. And by the way, if we don't have them, we make them up in our own head. Right? We start creating our own narratives in the absence of those that are shared by others. But we want to be able to be a member of something and share those stories. Like sharing these stories in a vacuum isn't fun at all. It's not human. So we want to share them. And I think in the initial days, the fungible token was one mechanism around that. But the non-fungible, I think, just creates a much deeper expression and a much more personalized expression, which is, uh, I think, you know, why NFTs are so powerful. Yeah. I'll, 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 I've I've retained from that that uh, I'll, I'll have to let my wife know that her 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 wedding ring is super special because it's non fungible <laughs> yes. with any other <laughs> wedding ring. So yeah, just cup, maybe taking a step back here and focusing on Animoca a little bit. So wh what is the investment thesis of Animoca and how how is Animoca um, different from how other you know typical investment funds operate? Well, so first of all, the investment funds of Animoca are different because it primarily, certainly historically, has come from balance sheet. So we didn't invest as a fund. We invested basically from, you know, corporate. Uh, that meant that basically we have, you know, we don't have a fund life cycle, right? meaning that we can hold things for the long term. And we also really made these investments in the past really about how we help build the sort of ecosystem and also how it hopefully plays out in the ecosystem that we're building. So for instance, when we, you know, made the early investments in OpenSea, actually, you know, we 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 had probably most of the trade volume in Office that wasn't very big, you know, back in 2020 and 2019 of an OpenSea were probably, you know, the, the the top NFT collections back in the day. And we didn't want to build our own marketplace. We just thought it made sense to use them and have them focus on the expertise of marketplaces while we focus on building games on have all the portfolio companies that were building games such as Axie Infinity trade their NFTs on OpenSea back in those days, right? So that's kind of what what we were focused on, um, and and so that's that's how we thought of it. Uh, but of course, as time went on, we felt that it was important to help see the ecosystem broadly, such that Animoca has now over 450 investments in Web3 and growing, because we see these network effects compound on themselves. So even if you know the project itself might not have the highest single returns, actually their existence in our ecosystem helps, you know, facilitate the growth of, you know, a dozen or two dozen other companies and they all build network effects and then they help each other out because in Web3, you have the ability to build on these networks in a permissionless manner, right? You don't need to have an API access. I can basically just, you know, um, you know launch my NFTs on OpenSea and trade them pretty much from the get-go. Um, or whether this is a sort of lending protocol or whatever, like it doesn't really need permission. And so the fact that we can then make the direct connections helpful to perhaps you know feature it or do some marketing benefits, but from a technical standpoint, the integration is pretty much straightforward because of the fact that most of it can be done sort of through this permissionless nature that is on chain. So anyway, that that is uh, that's sort of uh, the thesis around sort of building and compounding these network effects on top of it. Um, which is also one of the reasons why we started sort of building out Mochaverse as a way to help sort of yeah, you know, connect and unite these uh, so that we have a better way in which we can help construct these, these network effects. So Animoca is thinking of the way of, uh, of Web3 like constructing almost like a nation. And so that means that we spend and invest in a manner where we think these network effects develop that way. So for instance, investing in guilds, uh, we've done quite a few of them, isn't necessarily because we thought that each guild is going to be the biggest home run ever, but rather because we know that they will onboard Web3 gamers. Um, they will educate them. They will tell them what to do and, and, and maybe share in the value or sort of, you know, buy the goods that can be rented to the players, as an example, um, and in so doing, training them about Web3. So, so that's, a, that's valuable because that means every other one of our games in the ecosystem, we've done over 140 games, plus our own like Phantom Galaxies or Sandbox or Rec League or Gamey, for instance, and they benefit from the fact that these guilds exist in our ecosystem because they help train and onboard them, right? So that's kind of how we think about our investment thesis, um, which is a bit different from traditional VCs, which are obviously because they're a fund with third-party money, have to be very, uh, very much more directly um, sort of returns-oriented. Plus, they have a life cycle, right? 
So timing matters to them. So for instance, in the early days in 20, you know, we, we couldn't raise any money from traditional VCs in 2018, 2019. And most of the people, by the way, didn't disagree with our thesis. They didn't say, oh, Web3 gaming isn't interesting. Or oh, back then they call it NFT or blockchain gaming. They understood the thesis. They were just worried it was too early. And the reason why it mattered is because the fund life cycle was maybe already five years in. And if the cycle is wrong, then they might be, you know, after, they might be sitting on this investment for four years or five years and there would be no exit. And they then have an unwinded at a loss, right? So timing really matters, which is why it often appears that funds are very momentum oriented. Uh, but in a way, they almost have to because there's some, the, the fund life cycles are limited. Yeah, interesting. And um, yeah, how has the the bear market affected, say, Animoca's investments over the last 12 to 18 months? I mean, I guess more like, yeah, something like 12 months. And, you know, has the thesis evolved as a result of the market downturn? Well, I think the thesis, if anything, is strengthened because of the fact that builders are going to build in a bear market are the ones you really want to invest in, right? I mean, you think about sort of from a vintage perspective, which ones were the companies that really made Animoca well-known um, were the ones that we invested in between 2018 and 2020. Those were Dapper Labs and Dax Infinity and Wax and Decentraland and Sandbox and OpenSea, right? I mean, you know, and then later on Yuga Labs. I mean, these are the companies that defined the space, right? And we got, a, you know, in them in the early or first stage rounds, and they basically are the ones that have sort of helped shape that first wave. And sort of in the bear market, you know, those opportunities come about because also the builders who believe in the space will build in this environment because it's not necessarily just about the money, right? In this case, they're sort of much more mission oriented because frankly speaking, if it's about the money, you'll have pivoted to AI, <laughs> we have pivoted to some other industry out there that seems more obvious to raise capital from, for instance. Uh, whereas if you are a big believer in Web3, you will basically continue to build in the space um, because you you know you're that passionate about it, or or you see the, the the impact and purpose around whatever it is that you're building, right? So so those those are typically the best vintages. So while the quantum of um, companies we invested in is reduced, not because we necessarily don't want to make these investments, but because there's just less of them that are good, right? Um, we are still deployed uh, capital, and you see us make multiple investments, um, big and small. I mean, for instance, today we just announced. Our participation in Ton and becoming, you know, um, you know, one of the largest validators, for instance, um, in that network. But also, you know, previously we, like, literally, you know, days before we announced investment in another gaming project called Fracana, right? Um, so we continue to invest um, in the space. We haven't, we haven't really stopped. Cool. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, as a as a first time fund manager, you know, raising in this market, uh, I, I fully agree that now is like the best time to invest. Um, you know, we're, we're investing in, in infrastructure primitives along the, you know, the modular stack, interoperability primitives, things, things of that nature. Not, not so much in, in gaming and NFTs at, for the moment, at least. But, um, but it really feels like, you know, we're going against the grain in terms of, you know, what, what, what people are telling us, right? Like, you know, I got so many blank stares when I started raising the day after FTX collapsed. And, um, and so, you know, now we're, we're very happy to be, be able to deploy currently. Think about all the projects that you know you would have invested in over the last twelve months, whether these are tokens or even live tokens, for instance. Even you know one of the big opportunities in the last twelve months wasn't necessarily private investments, but public ones in the sense that yeah, there were absolutely. tokens already trading, and you would have had incredible returns if you did that. But you needed to have conviction in Web three to do it. If you didn't have conviction in Web three, if you were like I'm not sure about this, then it's hard. But if you knew that you know and you believed that this was something that was here to stay and the fundamentals are what they are then you, know, you don't mind if it's one or two years of a bear because eventually it will come back. And that's exactly what we've seen. I mean, you know, even something as large and fundamental as Bitcoin has essentially doubled in value from its lows from, say, 12, uh, 12 or so months ago. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's talk. I mean, you talked about Mochaverse, and so I'd, I'd like to maybe shift to NFTs here uh, more specifically. Um, and we'd love to, you know, understand like what what is mochaverse and what's the vision here but first i think one thing i'm curious about is you know animoca has i think lots of connections with big brands and has you know, sort of been a been a force to get brands to understand you know web3 and these concepts and and adopt them what what kind of 
big brands are you know, approaching NFTs, utilizing NFTs, experimenting. Who are the early adopters and who are the most um, forward thinking when it comes to adopting Web3? Well, generally, I think the most forward thinking brands that we've seen have been the luxury brands and the fashion brands, because in some ways they probably understand virtual value the best, <laughs> right? You know, like when you actually buy a Birkin bag, you know, how much of that value is you know, the materials or the pure utility of holding things in the bag? And the answer is, of course, nothing, right? That's not why you buy it, right? So what you're buying is 99% virtual in its construction. And that is, you know, when you talk to them about the metaverse and you talk about sort of, you know, what's important and why people buy it, the things that they do, which is about culture and community, they get it. So that's one of the reasons why they were one of the first ones in the space and continue to be investing in that space. Um, whether it's land or NFTs and, you know, they, they buy bored apes, they decorate on them, uh, they address the community. So they think they're quite forward, which is one of the reasons why, for instance, in Europe, particularly France, especially Paris, has actually, interestingly enough, been a hotbed of NFT innovation. I mean, it's not just Sandbox or, or sort of, or there's Dogami or there's like many other companies or like, you know, the, the Darewise Life Beyond, like these studios all evolving out of France because they understand that very, very well, for instance, right? So... So that's kind of, um, those are the one type of brands. The other ones that's interesting has been sort of in the financial services in Asia, right? For instance, you know, institutions like HSBC, Standard Chartered, DBS, um, you know, all of these sort of financial institutions uh, and also real estate companies like New World and, and Sungul Kai and all those guys have actually been very active in Web3 because they also understand the value of these things. Like in the case of, you know, for instance, like an HSBC, one of the reasons they would be building on Sandbox isn't because it look, looks like Minecraft and looks like a game or a metaverse, but it's because the average landowner in Sandbox has about half a million to a million dollars worth of assets that is visible on chain. So these are perfect private banking clients, right? And in some ways, it's not that different from, you know, basically, you know, opening up a shop in, you know, Fifth Avenue, for instance, or in Beverly Hills, because you want to address that customer, that audience and reach out to them, right? So, so you know, those are the type of, you know, early institutions that get it. Uh, and in Japan, for instance, you know, our, our, our investors and partners are groups like MUFG, which is the, one of the biggest banks in the world, um, and, and Mitsui, right? And again, these are financial institutions. They get it. And I think there's a correlation here as well. Those who understand financial systems well also are ones who are more easily attuned to Web3, whereas the type of brands and companies that are maybe not as oriented towards sort of, you know, the value of sort of things. Um, are less likely to be attuned to them uh, because of the fact that that's not their reach and also not their strategy and approach. And many of their natural customers might also not be that audience, right? So if you're a luxury brand, the kind of people who can afford, you know, a Rolex, right, for instance, or LVMH type of stuff are more likely going to be people who are also more financially literate. And therefore, the connection between that and Web3 is much more natural. You actually, you talked about Web3 and financial literacy in a talk recently. Uh, I saw a snippet of it on Twitter, and I was wondering if you could expand on uh, what you what you were trying to, to so, express there. So, I mean, the first point that we discovered in this sort of journey of Web3 is that most of the world is not financially literate. And the way that we define financial inclusion is you have a bank account, and therefore you're financially included. Yes, you can get your paycheck. But what do you do? Not very much. You get your paycheck and you spend it. How many people actually make investments or actually think about their capital or understand even compound interest? I mean, if they did, then they wouldn't be taking out, you know, you know credit cards with like crazy interest rates, for instance, and all that type of stuff, right? Um, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I guess traditional finance continues to take advantage of people like that because they lack financial literacy, right? It's, it's one of the reasons why regulation has to exist in order to sort of control these type of predatory tactics that we see. Uh, the traditional finance companies have done because they make money from it and get away with it. And, you know, I think the, 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 the you know, if you look in the US, the first time experience that most young people have on true finances is student debt. And it's a hot topic, obviously, but it's a problem because, you know, your first experience is essentially one of, you know, indentured servitude, but basically taking a loan that you have to repay probably for the next decade or plus so before you can even begin to build your own financial portfolio, for example, right? And that's just not a great outcome. And it also ensures, you know, a, a setup that is really not very strong. And it gives a sort of negative feeling towards 
finance and so this aspect of financial freedom becomes aspirational which is kind of crazy if you think about it um so so the thing that we believe in is that if you can teach children basically algebra and all sorts of math concepts then you can certainly teach them about compound interest and financial systems like you don't need to understand complex derivatives that's not what you need to know but you need to have some financial awareness and so we believe that it's entirely possible for our kids to basically build portfolios small as they will be um, so that by the time they go to college, even if they if they want to or need to, they'll have you know ways in which they maybe can pay for their studies or have a portfolio of their own, and will understand what they're getting into as well as a result of of all of this um, sort of you know financial stuff that's happening around them that they don't understand until much later in life. Right. So so we think that's a key skill that's needed, but you can't learn this in school in part because the teachers are financially illiterate as well. Right. They don't have portfolios. In fact, teachers are amongst some of the least paid people in the world. And therefore, you know, they live basically paycheck by paycheck. Even if they knew something about financial literacy, they can't even experiment because the other thing about financial literacy is an appetite and an understanding of risk, right? And if your life is essentially living sort of, you know, uh, hand to mouth type of thing, then risk is becoming, a very, it's like a luxury that you simply can't afford to do. So. So we have to sort of train and experiment with that at a younger age, with obviously not of things of great value. And we think Web3 and blockchain gaming is a great way of doing it. Because as children, we learn through games and to play anyway. But now as the world has evolved from physical to digital play, I mean, we spend in many cases something like half of our time awake or even more in some cases online in one form or the other. So we've been created essentially experiences where you learn about financial literacy that way that it evolves us essentially as we get older. And in gaming, we're already dealing with virtual currency and we're already kind of dealing with sort of skins and some kind of goods. But right now in Web2 games, you're not allowed to trade. You're not allowed to sell them. You're not allowed to create any financial value, small as it may be, because it's against the interest of the, those Web2 game studios. But in Web3, you're free to do all of that. And so in that environment, we believe that gaming, Web2 gaming, um, can actually bring in financial inclusion. As it has done, for instance, with Axie Infinity, back in 21 and 22, were millions of Filipinos who don't have any formal education, don't understand anything about money, but were able to open a crypto wallet and basically receive, trade, and spend, and fund basically in crypto. And that just means that it's, you know, if they can do it, then it's accessible to the world. Yeah, there's there's an interesting kind of like parallel to an article I read re I read recently. I, f I forget the who wrote the article, or, but I have, I'd have to look for it anyway. But but basically, the, the article sort of claimed that uh, the the like the Zoomers and the generations to come after them um, were going to be or you know were demonstrating um, some amount of. Uh, delusion about their actions in the real world because they grew up on the internet and because they grew up and this is I'm paraphrasing here but because they grew up in uh in sort of like a, a virtual environment with no real repercussions uh a lot of them were sort of socially awkward and and you know did things in the real world that you know were not in their best interest or uh that sort of um mirrored or echoed the types of behavior that they would have online and I, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I don't know if there's like any sort of real, you know, uh, sort of research behind that. But I wonder here with the risk thing, right? With the you know financial literacy thing, you know, if you if you sort of you grow up uh, taking these sort of fake risks uh, in a Web three game or some sort of like digital environment, you know, are you more predisposed to then like taking you know unnecessary risks in the real world? Where the consequences can be very different. I know this is sort of getting like deep and philosophical here, but no, 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 it's yeah. a good, it's a good point. But I think this is by the at the heart of many design questions when you think about designing games or experiences, and even when you think about designing financial systems in DeFi, for instance, that's a part of that, right? So first of all, I don't generally subscribe to that view because if that were true, then we take the view that we need to protect people from things of information or financial literacy or whatever that may be, right? And I mean, I remember, so, um, you know, I, I was I was there in the early internet in the early 90s. Um, you know, I was a CompuServe user in the 80s. And, you know, many of the arguments that were made at the time was around too much information is bad. We should basically limit access. People, you know, aren't smart enough. Um, you know, they're going to abuse all of that, right? And, you know, basically, you know, these were incumbent sort of 
um, information monopolies that didn't like the idea that suddenly there could be user-generated content and that it could be citizen journalism and that there could be someone out there who was not working for a newspaper or a magazine that suddenly had a voice, right? And that somehow seemed threatening. And the same was, by the way, true when YouTube came about. And then people said there was no way that anyone was Or the was Gutenberg press. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and, and, <laughs> or the car. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I mean, so so there's, there's always that type of um, scenario where you have persistence because change is scary in some ways, but also... Uh, it's disruptive. And I think the key point being is it's disruptive in which way. And I think, you know, broadly speaking, anything that makes access more egalitarian, more democratic, we think is positive, right? Uh, versus the opposite, meaning that if it is becoming more elitist or more controlled, that's negative. Because even though abuses will happen on a net basis, if more people have knowledge, it becomes more of an insulation of issues. For instance, if most of the world was financially literate, then the ability to perform financial crimes is very small. The reason why financial crimes is possible is because most people don't know what they're doing, right? Or they get entitled. And so we need regulation for good reasons, because we need to protect people, because they truly don't know. But how do we define that? Well, net worth. Okay, but hold on, right? That means in some ways, if I don't achieve that net worth, I never have the ability to get there in the first place. Therefore, how am I actually able to participate, right? So the system had good intentions, but ended up having an effect that, you know, to protect them, had to find them a way to identify whether you were financially literate or not, which isn't the same, right? You could be financially literate and not have a lot of money and therefore still be the right person to do that. I mean, you know, think about financial, you know, financial institutions. Every person who starts off as an analyst in, in, in one of the big banks didn't start off as a millionaire, right? They came fresh out of school. They probably have student debt. They have negative equity, right? And yet, you know, they got the opportunity to work there, right? Um, so which means that we can take people who are not financially sort of, you know, um, successful and bring them into the world of financial success. And and if most of the world had this, then we think it's more self-inoculating. Um, and the same is true for information as well, right? In the early days, we just simply believed what the newspaper wrote, right? And today, frankly speaking, we realize that newspapers are as biased as us, maybe even more so. And so we take a more nuanced perspective. Unfortunately, that hasn't been good for seeking truth. Uh, it has been confusing for people who always thought that maybe there was one source of truth. But now we realize that there's multiple sources and we need to take perspectives and we need to analyze and we need to basically not take things for granted the way that we do, right? So to me, I think of it as, as a net positive to as long as it becomes more open and democratic. This kind of touches on another topic that I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, uh, about I think like I think Web three games um, probably because of Axie Infinity were you know quite used in sort of like the Philippines Southeast Asia. What what is it that most people on the West fail to understand about these markets and the relationship with uh, Web three gaming and NFTs? So I actually think that the West, in particular US, more so than even Europe, has taken a very negative view to NFTs and because of the view they have on crypto. And more specifically, the view on capitalism. So the point is that, you know, there was a recent Pew study that showed that I think 60% of Americans under the age of 30 preferred socialism over capitalism. This analysis would have come out, say, a decade or so ago in the US, that would have been impossible. But today, actually being anti-capitalist is a political platform. And, you know, I, I mean, party members in the US are basically campaigning against capitalism effectively. Maybe they don't say it in that way, but in effect, they are going to war against capitalism. You know, it's a, you know, billionaires are a fault in the system. You know, you know, the working hard isn't really fair, right? Inherited wealth, you know, you know, all these things are basically things that have become points of attack. And for good reason, because over the last two decades or three decades or so, labor has basically underperformed greatly in comparison to capital. And unfortunately, those people who have not been in the capital class and have basically been in the labor class, which is still the majority of people in the world, like in America, for instance, um, they've basically been on a net basis are probably making less money than their, than their parents have. And that's basically um, unprecedented in the case of you know, recent history. And also means that people who don't have access to this money then look at money as feudal themselves. It's like, that's unfair. Like, why do you have this, right? Whereas I remember when I first went with the US in the 90s, even though it was a recession, it was still about sort of a meritocratic approach, which was like, if you work hard, you'll make it. Uh, everyone just had this goal. 
And if you had success and you made money, then it was celebrated as you know, self-made men and, or, or women or whatever that may be. Uh, that's kind of that narrative doesn't really seem to exist anymore, right? Um, and you know, when I was basically stuck during COVID in California, I you know I, I began to understand this when I started seeing sort of the sentiment, you know, what was happening in San Francisco, for instance, right? I was stuck in in the Bay Area, uh, and sort of this sort of sort of incredible anti sort of you know um, sort of uh, campaign against those that had had wealth or you know Silicon Valley uh, people even you know who are working in Silicon Valley companies. It wasn't even related to you know, founders of these businesses, uh, people really didn't like them because because of the fact that, um, you know, they were wealthier and it seemed unfair to them. And so now you take this into the world of gaming, which is by, by its design, quite meritocratic in terms of skill. If you're a good gamer, you don't have to pay money to be a good gamer. And then you introduce things like NFTs. The first reaction you have is, wait, does it mean that I need to suddenly pay thousands of dollars to enjoy my favorite game? Or even worse, if someone who spends thousands of dollars, does he mean he is better than me now in the game? Then he show things, present himself in a way that I couldn't anymore. Whoa, 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 right? That's something we just, we can't have, right? Like, and, and I think this is something that's not just felt inside um, sort of the gamers themselves, but also in the studios that make games because game designers and game developers themselves are kind of in the same category. Now you go to Asia, for instance, the opposite is true where people are excited. The biggest game studios and game companies in the world, I mean, outside of ourselves, like Square Enix or, or Sega and so on, they're all embracing Web3 and they're talking about tokenizing their game systems and they're talking about NFTs and, and blockchain because they are excited about property. And I think this has to do with the history of Asia as well. You think about a place like South Korea, you know, which is one of the biggest gaming places in the world today, 12th or 13th largest GDP. 40 years ago, its GDP was smaller than North Korea. It was one of the poorest countries in the world. And actually, that is true for most of Southeast Asia. If you look at Indonesia, if you look at the Philippines, if you look at all these places, these were, for the most part, pretty desolate places. The Philippines is a bit of an exception, but that's a different story. But anyway, China, for instance, also, you know, hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty over the last 40 years. Uh, so, you know, how is it possible? Property rights, basically, embracing capitalism, right? I mean, yes, you know, China may have the sort of communist mantle, but it's as, as it's more more capitalist than most of Europe <laughs> in terms of, you know, when it comes to economics and business. And so that embrace and people have benefited from that, have basically seen how, you know, that worked. And so they're excited about capitalism. And I sometimes joke about this, uh, but it's sort of somewhat true. You know, the American dream seems to be more alive and well in Asia than it is in America itself. And so things like Web3, property rights, NFTs, uh, you know, land in sandbox, uh, you know, these are things that actually excite them and they see the opportunity because in living memory, this has benefited them in the real world versus what they have experienced uh, in the US. Uh, I think that kind of echoes the, you know, a lot of ways. I mean, you, you, you grew up in Austria, right? And, and so we're, I'm, here in, I'm here in France. And uh, I think there is this uh, this sort of like working class sentiment that, you know, at least in France, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about like Austria. I think this kind of overlaps with Germany a little bit, although also oh, definitely. But, definitely. But that, that like there is this working class sentiment that you know uh, work is a burden, uh, that uh, merit like it's sort of like this anti meritocratic uh, kind of ideology that you know permeates through some you know some aspects, some parts of society, you know, and and I think that that in a lot of ways. Echoes in the sentiment that like crypto uh, is not like a serious thing or that it's like that it's a scam, right? It is like sort of downplaying this thing that is inherently meritocratic. And um, and I sort of like see that all around me. And then I, you know, sort of wonder um, why, well, like why, uh, why the U.S.? I mean, I think in the U.S. it's particularly like uh, interesting how there's been this shift from like uh, the meritocratic ideology to like this anti-capitalist sort of ideology, yeah. And so, I mean, I mean, I grew up in Austria um, in the seventies and eighties, and you know that was still the time when there was the Iron Curtain. So basically, you know, going from east to west. And my mom used to work in the eastern side of Germany in East Berlin. So when I would cross over to see her, uh, you know, it was a totally different world. And I think it did shape my thinking around why capitalism is better 
why we need property rights. Although back in the day when I was a kid, I didn't really think about it this way, but it certainly is a vivid memory that I have in terms of sort of the desolate environment that was, I mean, it was literally 1984 in East, East, uh, in East Germany, for instance. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, in the social democratic countries, um, meaning Germany and, and Austria, uh, and maybe to a certain extent France, I think France is a little bit different, but still sort of shares much of the same sentiment. You can't really talk about money in the same way. You know, like money is um, is almost dirty to talk about money. Um, you know, and then I went to the US and then everyone was like, money, 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 right? And look at my stuff that I bought. And then I came to Hong Kong and that was basically capitalism on steroids where it wasn't, it was, it was like, it was like everything was about money. And if you didn't have any, then you were worth nothing. And then you had the other side of the problem, which was the extreme side of what happens when you have sort of excess capitalism and where you basically sort of, you know, a capitalism at all costs, right? It didn't matter um, basically at what expense it was, right? So you, so there was, you know, so that definitely shaped the thinking. But I think also when you look at Germany and Austria, and I think the the the, the American influence in the early days is that work and labor was considered good, right? I mean, it was it was pure. If you worked hard, that was how you identified yourself, and that was kind of the really it was the Protestant and eventually evangelical sort of perspective. Arbeit Max Frei actually came from like from Diefenbach. It was not the Nazis. I mean, they stole it. I mean, they stole a lot of things. But this this sentence, you know, it, it, this this philosophy came from the Protestant uh, philosophy, right? And of of like work sets you free. Work makes you a better person. And and so you know, a lot of people confuse that. But yeah, no, absolutely. And it was sort of this, I guess, the um, original sort of uh, Martin Lutheran perspective. Which then, you know, because of the first wave of immigrants, basically went from Europe to the U.S., uh, were basically um, very Protestant or, I guess, evangelical in nature. And so they brought that work culture with them. And it worked for them as well because it was a new land. It was a new opportunity. And you had to work hard and sacrifices were made. But also because everyone started almost at the same ground zero, right? So you didn't have the issues of inherited wealth. You didn't have the issues of you know, a king or king, queen or royalty that basically sort of had structures around limiting your success and these monopolies that were established, right? And so that worked for a while. But of course, you know, in the US in the last 20, 30 years, you know, inadvertently, um, partially because of the inflation of money, right? And partially because of the econ economics involved and, and um, you know, money and because of the way that inheritance works and so on, money became feudal in its own way. If you had money, you would make more money. If you had money, you could get to better universities. You could get access to better education. And suddenly this whole meritocratic idea was destroyed because it's like, wait, I can't get into that school, even though I seem to be pretty smart. Working hard doesn't give me that effort. Um, and, 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 and that's really, I think, kind of what America is searching for. I think the battle of America's soul is kind of based a little bit on, on that over the last uh, sort of, you know, I would say, decade in American politics. Um, which I think is impacting as a result um, um, sort of the perspectives on, on crypto and Web3. And you can kind of see that from the perspective of the Democratic versus the Republican Party, you know, where their battle lines are being formed. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've kind of departed here from the topic yeah. of NFTs, yeah. but this is, this is really interesting. I mean, let's, uh, let's maybe really back in. Um, you know, wh what are some of the other use cases for NFTs that you're really excited about? I mean, I think everybody knows about the PFPs and, you know, like gaming skins and maybe to some extent, some financial applications like using NFTs and, you know, uh, 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 to, to represent liquidity positions or even, you know, domain names in the case of a VNS. But what are some of the, like in the next cycle, what are going to be like the hot, like the really interesting NFT use cases that you're most interested in and that like, Animoca is investing in? So, I mean, first, uh, I mean, gaming applications are obviously the utility side, but the one thing that we think is really important when it comes to NFTs is you can't not marry and include the financial aspect of NFTs in and of itself, right? Even if it's not intrinsic, you know, and before it was just in the trading patterns, but now basically you can actually really have it as a way in which you can share ownership in things. Um, on an individual basis. So for instance, I have two examples. One of them is in games and the other one is in education, which we're really excited about. And that's something we're really pushing with Open Campus and, and Tiny Tap. Um, but let me first talk about the gaming example. In Rec League, for instance, if you're you know, basically owning the NFTs, then if a Web2 gamer plays the game, he doesn't have to buy the NFT, 
but he can rent them, which is effectively what they do in all the games. He may think of it as buying the skin, but effectively he's renting it. The owner of the original NFT of that design now receives a revenue share directly because it's his NFT, right? It's like, and, and that actually creates a nice blend between the Web3 and the Web2 gamer that can still enjoy the game, but they have different ways in which they interact with that financial layer, shall we say, right? Uh, because the Web2 gamer may only want to pay a dollar or two to enjoy the experience. He doesn't want to buy and own something. And that's okay, right? Same people why people rent a house versus buy a house, for instance, or rent a car versus buy a, buy a car, for instance, right? So, we, so, so I think the new Web3 games that are coming out are more elegantly sort of marrying the blend between that two. And I think, you know, in 24, we're going to see some very interesting developments because many of these games are about to come out, for instance. And then the other area which I'm really excited about is what's happening in education. You know, for instance, with um, you know, most recently we just did another batch of sales of what we call publisher NFTs, and publisher NFTs are NFTs that teachers created to create learning content. It could be like English, Spanish, whatever courses. And these courses are currently being rented, essentially, or sold in in places like TinyTap, and they they earn a yield, right? You know, they might make ten dollars, or fifty dollars, or hundred dollars a year. It's paid for by parents or teachers who then give it to their kids, right? Think of it as a as a kind of Coursera or a, a sort of, you know, YouTube learning program where you pay a subscription fee and whoever makes the content gets a fee for that. But now when you own the NFT of that course content, you now own basically the revenue stream from that. You also can promote it. So you can make it more famous if you want or more more desirable or improve on it and you know, maybe make more revenue. So, you, so it's yours now. But the point is, is that a teacher is now able to create their own yield instrument. And one of the problems is, that before selling on these type of intellectual property assets wasn't possible or feasible because the cost of doing so was very high. So unless it made at least tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, you wouldn't be able to sell it on to someone because the cost of the lawyer, the contract rights, and the whatever that they needed to do in negotiation was just too lengthy. So you just couldn't do it. But that's a problem for, for instance, places like you know, for instance, Venezuela or Philippines where teachers might only make 10 or $20 a month and where whatever content they create um, might only generate an additional 10 or $20 a year, right? So that's nice add-on income, but it's not going to be life-changing. But now I can buy that same content, maybe for 50 or $100, and in so doing, I get a 20% yield, but the teacher basically makes half a year of the salary. And that becomes life-changing and that changes. And of course, what happens when we did that is that the teachers then start to make more content and start to create businesses around it. And that's basically what happens when you have property rights and intellectual property protection, right? You can build foundations of businesses on top of it. I mean, if you didn't have property rights in the democratic institutions that we live in today, if America didn't have property rights, then you wouldn't have businesses and you wouldn't have mortgages and banking facilities and a way in which you can have capital formation, which is basically now possible with NFTs that can be represented because through a transaction of less than a dollar, I can have the contract rights, the IP rights, the finance, where the money goes, everything done in one single transaction. Um, and I don't need a lawyer. I don't need all that kind of stuff uh, to be able to sort of do that. Uh, and I think this, this is really powerful, not just for developing countries, but also for any other place for other type of assets that you want to sell or offer and opens up intellectual property rights management to every segment of content creation. Um, so for instance, even with something like Dance Fight, you know, dancers are not able to immortalize their moves as NFTs. And again, that sounds whimsical and silly and stupid. You might say, why would you do that? But, you know, these dancers have had their moves ripped off by big games like in Fortnite, who basically turned them into emotes and emojis. And they don't give credit to the creators because they had no way of basically in sort of demonstrating that they were the creators of this. And again, NFTs can solve that. So there's many cool use cases that are evolving and many more that we haven't even imagined that I think uh, will sort of really create space in the culture and entertainment and education space. It, you know, in, in the kind of Web3 infra, like crypto infra, we've, we've seen like this modularization of the stack and also a modularization of the application level. Is this also happening in the NFT space? I mean, it sounds like it, right? From what you're describing, right? Like how, how does that like overlap? Well, I mean, what happens is that we describe it generally as interoperability, but really what happens is that Owning an NFT or NFTs makes you the owner and the plat and the NFTs themselves platforms, meaning that companies and businesses are now building experiences, stacks, or even new chains on top of the ownership 
of essentially the, uh, the, the, the NFTs in question because they become targeted audiences and customers. Like you know, the example I gave about people who are interested in sandboxes because they want to address the customers of sandbox, right? Or for instance, if you want to build something for people who own board apes, they don't do it because um, you know they just love board apes, but because the board apes represent a community of very high net worth individuals. Um, or for instance, you know one of the uh, Web three games, which is also part of our portfolio called Pixels, is is becoming very successful. But we built on Ronin, and Ronin is a chain which is basically um, some you know supported by the guys behind um, Axie Infinity, Sky Mavis. Uh, and why did that sort of uh, take off? Because people on Ronin were gamers on Axie Infinity. And so it was natural for them to basically play another game, um, you know, within the network because they had already a mass network effect of that effect. So the, the the thing is that, you know, the culture layer, as it were, which represented through NFTs, allows basically people to then compose all sorts of brand new experiences on top um, because it's on chain. That's exactly the beautiful part about it. And it's permissionless nature. I mean, they could be vampire attacks, but the reality is that it's of value to the owner, right? If I own this NFT, then I create value. I, I receive potentially valuable experiences because people will build to reach me as opposed to I have to go somewhere and seek permission, you know, to have access, right? I mean, today in Web2 games, if Apple or Steam doesn't like you, then forget it. <laughs> you're, you're, you don't exist, for instance, right? You don't have a way for gamers to, to reach out to you, for instance, properly, uh, because they are the gatekeepers. And here, essentially, you know, it's decentralized down to the point to the end user. Yeah, that no, makes sense. You do know, you do you think that that met the that Web three games and you know this concept of the metaverse? Do do you think that the value here is decentralization in the long term, right? Because like having a fully like b building a powerful brand or a powerful IP or even leveraging existing IP costs a lot of money um, and requires a lot of funding. And, you know, it is the value here that these networks are truly decentralized or that we have record of ownership and sort of, you know, uh, audit trail of ownership, you know, is, is the censorship resistant aspect here as important as say, you know, with financial as assets or like more fungible assets? So one of the things that we love about the space is the irony in the way that in some ways, the more you give up control, the more value is retained in the network and the community. So perhaps the best parallel I could say is that if Bitcoin happened to be, you know, um, if there happened to be a set of miners that basically controlled the hash rate of Bitcoin, for instance, what would the value of Bitcoin be at that moment? <laughs> it would basically sink down to probably almost zero because it would be so heavily compromised and nobody would trust it the same way, right? And so there's a lot of reasons why people don't want to see that happen. And in a way, maintaining its decentralization is retaining your self-interest, right? And that's actually, I would say, very true in, in sort of what you talk about L2 and L1s as well, um, in the early constructions and also in the game systems that are out there. Because it's early, it is prom often working on the premise of the promise. But if the promise is you know, broken or is something you don't have faith in, then you move on to the other one that actually says they'll do that for you, right? And so again, you know, Ethereum, for instance, is, you know, even though it has expensive gas and, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, the most efficient, the fact that it is so decentralized is actually one of the main reasons why, you know, most of the volume and most of the valuable assets exist on Ethereum because, you know, it's the one network that is hardest to compromise. Whereas there's, you know, examples of many other, you know, L2s, for instance, that are arguably much cheaper, much more efficient, but yet don't have the same traction despite its technical efficiency because they haven't captured sort of the cultural aspect of it, which is the trust of the network, which comes from decentralization, but also from, you know, the way that they've built communities around it. And if the community can't have a sense of ownership, then actually they, you know, um, because, you know, they don't have control over it, so as it were, then they start to, um, it, it compromises the trust in the network, which, by the way, is, is the same as it runs for nations and governments and countries as well, right? I mean, you know, um, you know, I live in Hong Kong and, you know, China is an extremely well-run country. I mean, you know, if, you, if you've experienced it, things are efficient. 
uh, stuff gets done much faster than in the US, right? You know, you can build railways and train stations and stuff, you know, with no fuss. And yet there's a liquidity discount, you know, in businesses and companies in, in, in China. And why is that? It's because there is a perceived centralization risk, right? And we've seen that effect. If China wants to make a change, they can make that change in good and bad ways, right? In a very top-down manner. And many people in China have been affected by that. And while prior to COVID, a lot of people were lauding the fact that China was really efficient in everything they did. And many, you know, people in the US were saying, hey, you know, it's just much more efficient this way. We should just all go towards that kind of setup. And then, you know, when the decision was flipped the other way, it's like, oh, hold on a second, wait a second. We're not sure about that, right? Whereas in the US, it's chaotic. It's the other way around. If you want to make a change, it takes forever to get that change. And you have to go through voting and you have to go through institutions and you have to lobby and it may never happen. But that means that your property rights in that sense is secure, right? You know, that if you someone wanted to be chain making a fundamental change to the ownership of your things, you know, um, outside of you doing illegal stuff, obviously, then it requires such a major constitutional change that most of the country has to agree, which probably won't happen. Right. And therefore, you have a premium for that. Right. Um, so so I think the same principles apply in, in, in blockchain, obviously, because it's young um, and, you know, the markets are still early in development. You know, you have these early developmental cycle issues. So you have, you know, you know, um, price imbalances and you have sort of, you know, these things that happen when 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 projects emerge. And, you know, because of the speculative nature, because capitalism is heavily embedded in Web3, you also have people who participate in ways that might not seem logical because, you know, because of greed, for instance, right? Um, that's, however, indistinct from the long-term value. So, um, so these might be short-term issues, but these are not uh, these these aren't the ones that build long-term value. Long-term value are the ones that embrace decentralization, which means also gaming projects, if they want to succeed for the long term, have to be decentralized. NFT collections, by definition, are decentralized. Right? I mean, if you end up maintaining 80% of the supply of your NFTs, it'll have a very different feel than when the community owns a majority of the NFT collection and has uh, a right to open. Very interesting points. Um, yeah, I, I think this uh, this sort of like premium for decentralization, even when we talk about nation states, is a good way to look at, you know, uh, economies of different countries and or or even different re different areas, right? I mean, yeah, it's a it's good to look at it. Um, I, you know, we're, we've got a couple more minutes here, and I do want to ask you a little bit about uh, MochaVerse and some of the the the, the brands that um, that Animoca has uh, in its portfolio. Yeah, what, what what is the MochaVerse and what's interesting about this IP? I think Cool Cats also is one of the brands that uh, in the in the portfolio. So I mean, Cool Cats is, yeah. is, is in, someone we invested in. It's kind of like um, similar to Board Apes, but it's cats, and you know, it's the internet. Who love, everyone loves cats, um, you know. And it's it's it, that, that to me is you know, I guess a classic PFP. We just did a partnership with them outside of the investment with uh, with a Japan operation with AB Animoca Brands KK. Or basically turning them into sort of you know I guess a manga brand as well in Japan and opening that up so that should be pretty exciting, um, and that's really about the culture and community side of things. And, and so this brand ha actually has like a, a a show like there's episodes and characters. It's going to and... it's going to have stuff. It's not there yet, right? And so our partnership is basically helping them build up some some, some cool developments, uh, and which by the way is just another example of what you can do with with cool IP. Uh, and you know just as a parallel, I would say. Rarely, if ever, in my own history, have I seen, you know, major brands evolve um, the way that they have with sort of influence and financial capacity than those brands in Web three. Right? If you look at Yuga Labs with Board Apes, if you look at Cool Cats, if you look at even our own Mochaverse, or if you look at Sandbox, or you know, Azuki, for instance, right? Or you know, Pachi Penguins and so on. Right? I mean, these are all incredible um, projects that were non-existent brands some two, three years ago, right? and have now become brands that are maybe more influential than some longer standing brands out there, right? So that's, that, that sort of demonstrates the, you know, the, the power of sort of you know, how Web3 community building and sort of capital formation can, can give effect. Now, what is Mochaverse? Mochaverse is really a way for initially, um, we have an NFT collection as well that starts it off this way, and you know, the Mocha ID um, is the next phase which we've started to launch, which is a way in which we create soulbound NFTs 
that essentially create a, a, a digital decentralized digital identity, right? Um, and I think the the, the whole uh, concept around this decentralized DID is that you have a way in which you can now address our community uh, in a sort of permissionless manner uh, that is also uh, sort of, I guess, in some ways verified. So one of the experiences we had, you know, as we launch games, uh, we, we, we sometimes do KYC. So because of an NFT mint, you know, we did this with other deed, we did it with Rec League and a bunch of other games. And every time we do this, we have to re KYC because the wallets get tossed around, right? So for instance, in our most recent, in our most recent sale, I think something like 30 or 40,000 wallets in our allow list ended up in the hands of people that were not actually doing the KYC because you could trade your wallets. And we're like, wait a second, that, that's an issue. Uh, so that's the first one. And the second point is that, you know, it's costly to do KYC over and over again. And so if we end up having, you know, again, with a, with a uh, sort of DID, you don't have to disclose who the person is, but now you know that it's KYC. And so it means that I can do an NFT mint or I can do something with them without actually necessarily having to re-KYC and pay money time and time again. Um, so that's, again, something valuable. Uh, and of course, we have with our 450 portfolio companies with, you know, the millions of, 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 of users in, in that network and the addressable space being actually in the hundreds of millions, we can now create a way in which we can sort of combine and connect essentially all of these users in the kind of, I guess, social network, uh, not really saying social fi, but really in the social network where then third parties who are not necessarily part of Animoca can now benefit from its network effect as well. Like meaning if you're launching a game, you can use Mocha ID and Mochaverse to launch that um, and access this community uh, without actually necessarily having to be a portfolio company, for instance, right? Which currently is quite manual, right? We, 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 we launch, we do a partnership, we do announcements, we do that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, that's okay, but that actually ends up becoming quite tedious. Uh, whereas now, you know, basically we can create essentially our own, our own, I guess we could call it like a quasi L2 of culture where everyone who can participate in Mochaverse can now get the benefit of that. And the other thing that we've also done is we've added a governance layer. So if you own the Mochaverse NFTs, um, you basically are able to vote on our, on our treasuries. Um, so the most famous example that we've done is with ApeCoin. So we have um, basically um, you know, millions of ApeCoin that is basically um, with the Mochaverse community, which is decentralized, the ownership of the NFTs. And they vote basically um, you know, on our treasury or part of our treasury what they, you know, what what ApeCoin as, you know, from a, from a DAO perspective can and or cannot do. Uh, and it's interesting in the beginning, obviously it was viewed a little bit sensitive because it's a separate community that has a say in ApeCoin. But, you know, we thought that was better because it ended up bringing the two communities together. Uh, and now many sort of Mochaverse holders have board apes and ApeCoin and ApeCoin holders have Mochaverse and they've become an integrated community as they've kind of become a kind of super pack, if you will, for ApeCoin. Uh, and have ended up creating, you know, these interesting political structures that have become more inclusive and has grown the ecosystem as a result, which is what we think will happen broadly across the board. Uh, and for us, that's what, how we want our communities to grow. You know, we have large token reserves and, and, and token balances, but we don't want to be the ones that are sort of, you know, voting on them. We want our community to basically um, to have votes over them because it also teaches them about the space and you know, gives them a sense of ownership, uh, even if it's not economic. Um, and that's basically giving them, you know, rights to our, our tokens from a governance standpoint. And that's how Mochaverse plays a role as well. So it's kind of almost like a DAO of DAOs, if you will, um, in, its, its, in its top level construction. It's a DAO DAO. <laughs> cool. Well, I, you know, I, I, I've got so many more questions that I didn't get a chance to go through, but this has been really fascinating. And, um, you know, I want to thank you so much for your time and your really thoughtful answers. Uh, you know, before we wrap up here, what's the end game? I mean, you know, in, in five to 10 years, what is this space going to look like? And, you know, maybe because I, I didn't use the metaverse buzzword yet. I'm going to ask you this, like, how does the metaverse tie into the end game? Um, you know, I, like, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing Apple glass and Facebook glasses and, you know, all of these sort of AAR, um, devices, you know, does it, does it tie into the end game and yeah, what's your, your sort of long, long-term view here? So first, um, when we talk about the metaverse, um, specifically, we mean the open metaverse we talk about digital property rights right, as the foundation of that. 
And things like AR and VR and you know screens and other great experiences are wonderful in that they enhance and deepen our experiences, but they're not the meaning of the metaverse itself. Right. So, and I think this is the part where a lot of people get confused because you know you are already kind of in the metaverse when you're playing a game, and having a VR goggle doesn't actually make that experience uh, sort of you know more fundamentally different. Yes, it's deeper as an experience; it's more immersive. Right. But uh, ultimately, if you're not owning the things that you do in the metaverse, it's all meaningless anyway. Right? So we think the foundation starts with property rights. Right? And that's only possible in Web3 and blockchain. Right? Whether that is on this chain, that chain, that doesn't really matter. In fact, we believe in a multi-chain future. Um, that's the other thing. And so when we think of the end game, what we believe in is that you know, because we spend so much time digitally, and because of most of the value is constructed and built in a digital way, um, we think that the end, I wouldn't call it an end game, it's ever evolving, but you know, the way that we're advancing to, I think it will sort of give us ownership in everything that we do online. So meaning the new social networks of the future, the games that we play in the future, the environments that we're online, we, through our participation, become essentially owners of the network. We become stakeholders, uh, which basically means to me that um, you know, it's just a fairer form of capitalism, right? Which has gone kind of wrong with shareholder capitalism, where only a select few get to benefit from the benefits of something, and everyone else is just there to be extracted from. Whereas in this kind of stakeholder capitalism, everyone basically, um, you know, through their contribution, gets to share in that. Because you know, today, if I'm a user in Instagram, um, actually I contribute value. I basically work for Instagram. I, you know, I bring my users there. I engage with them. But actually, what do I get is, you know, it's, 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 it's likes, which is basically the cheapest zero value currency <laughs> there is, right? You know, um, you know, which, you know, arguably we could say is probably the bigger scam out there because you're giving them a form of a, of a zero value token that really doesn't mean anything. Um, but it gives you the illusion that it's something of value. Um, and the platforms also benefit. But in this future network, you know, whether it's in games or whether it's in social networks, you basically accrue value in the networks that you help construct. Because after all, if there's no users in Instagram, Instagram's value is zero. And that's why they're true for games and every single digital experience. And so we think that really what will happen, and we think there'll be thousands and tens of thousands of these experiences, and we will have ownership in our various communities, big and small, that we get to participate in. We will, um, we, you know, we will see a reshaping of capitalism. So meaning that I think this could be the way in which capitalism is rescued from its narrative, where people say, wait, actually, capitalism is this beneficial force. Because without capitalism, we won't have entrepreneurship, we won't have innovation, we won't have the incentives. It's just gone a little bit off the rails. We used to have things like antitrust, right, <laughs> which, which helped break up monopolies, which they've become powerless in the data paradigm. And so Web3 actually is the solution to that. And so, you know, a, a sort of a, I guess, thought experiment I sometimes give to people when they ask me to think about this more deeply is to say, well, you know, why, for instance, isn't every Uber driver also not a shareholder in Uber? Right? It doesn't make sense to me. But now, because of that, you know, Uber in the future is going to have driverless cars. But the people who helped make Uber are the drivers, you know, and and now they're going to be basically pushed out of a job eventually with driverless cars because Uber doesn't really need them. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons why there's so much frustration. And this, by the way, isn't only in the case of Uber. It's in the case for everything that's happening in the classic shareholder capitalist framework. Um, and, and I think in, in the Web3, through tokenization effectively, you make everyone a stakeholder, big and small, right? Nobody said you had to have the same value or the same contribution, right? Capitalism doesn't work if everyone gets exactly the same, right? That's more like communism. But, but um, through your effort and your work and your contribution to the network, you receive essentially something of value, right? Perhaps it's sort of a kind of different inter iteration of proof of work, although not, you know, obviously in, in sort of the, in, in the blockchain narrative, but it is essentially, you know, if you think about the oldest forms of, value in our capitalist economies. It was, it was our work that we did and the proof of work that we performed in the physical way. So I think that's basically the next step that we can sort of come back to in this future metaverse that's sort of building out in, in, in Web3 and blockchain. Hot take, the future of crypto is proof of work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what, let, let's end on that. <laughs> sure.
Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for for coming on the podcast. It's been great chatting. And uh, yeah, hope we can do this at some other point. We didn't even talk about AI. We didn't. Really, yes, yes. We didn't. We didn't really go in depth on gaming. Um, maybe I can get you on my other podcast. We could do another another yeah. show there. Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. a little bit more in depth on the gaming side. But yeah, thanks again. Thanks again, and uh, look forward to chatting soon. Thank you for having me.